Um, the next talk flew to us in Dresden from all the way in Russia. Um, our next speaker, yes, scoot closer. Not too close though, social distancing. Yes. <laughs> um, our next talk came to us all the way from Russia. Our next speaker is Sergei. Um, he lives in Russia as and works as an as a developer, works with um, open source software whenever, wherever he can, especially PHP. He has uh, a daughter, and he actually told us that this is his very first talk at a conference ever. Um, so let's be kind to him. Let's support him. Let's not scare him. So maybe he, he will do this again next year. We sure um, hope so. <laughs> and uh, we are ready to hear his introduction to asynchronous PHP and React PHP. Enjoy his talk. Hi everybody, my name is Sergey, and today I want to talk to you about asynchronous PHP and React PHP. We will cover the basics of asynchronous code and how it may work in PHP. We will discuss pros and cons of going async and how we can improve performance of the already written synchronous PHP application using a synchronous approach. I think that nowadays in PHP community, there is no common agreement about asynchronous code. One part of the community considers async PHP as something new and interesting that can solve some performance issues, while another part of the community is strongly against asynchronous PHP and suggests using Node.js or Go for solving performance-sensitive tasks. Let's try to understand why this happens, why many people don't consider PHP as a suitable tool for solving asynchronous tasks. As for me, I like PHP and I want to use it to solve different tasks. Also, I don't want to limit myself with request response cycle. Moreover, I don't want to extend my stack with a new language with its own ecosystem just because someone on Twitter or on Reddit said that PHP is not the right tool for my problem. So why many people are against asynchronous PHP? And I think that the most popular reason is that PHP wasn't created for it, for this sort of tasks, that PHP is only about web and rendering HTML pages. On the one hand, yes, it's hard to argue that PHP wasn't designed to be asynchronous, but truth be told, it also wasn't invented as a language for creating large and complex applications. Let's be honest, in those times, there was no JavaScript at all, and people even didn't think about the asynchronous stuff. Everybody just rendered HTML synchronously, and people were happy with it. But since then, almost everything has changed. It is 2020 now, we have Composer, with a huge community around it. And the language itself has evolved a lot. Now we have powerful frameworks that help us to create really complicated enterprise applications. And step by step, PHP is no longer only about request response. We have backend and frontend. We, de we develop different APIs. We make different integrations with other infrastructure systems. And of course, CLI commands are a very common thing nowadays. And furthermore, the requirements for our program have also changed a lot. Now we count milliseconds and want our scripts to execute very fast. And how does asynchronous execution help us here? How can it increase application performance? To better understand this, let's classify what types of execution we have. We have synchronous, where we have one thread, like traditional PHP. We have asynchronous execution, still one thread, but we add concurrency here. This way, Node.js and React PHP work. And we have parallel execution with many threads. For example, Python can work this way. But to better understand the difference between them, we can use an analogy with a restaurant. Let's imagine that there is a customer who wants to eat spaghetti and meat. So we have a kitchen that represents our program, and we have chefs that represent the threads. In a traditional synchronous PHP application, we have one single chef. 
He goes to the kitchen, goes to the stove, puts a pot of water, then sits down and waits for the water to boil. As soon as the water boils, the chef takes spaghetti, puts it into the pot and waits for spaghetti to cook. When the spaghetti is ready, the chef proceeds to the sauce, puts it on the stove and again sits down and waits until the sauce is cooked. So in general, the picture is clear. The chef does everything sequentially in order. One action, then another, then the next one, and so on. In an asynchronous program, things happen a little bit differently. As before, we have one chef. The chef fills the pot with water, puts it on the stove. But this time, instead of sitting and waiting for the water to boil, the chef immediately takes another pot, fills it with sauce and puts it on the stove. And only then the chef stops, sits down and waits for any of them to boil. Because at the moment the chef has nothing more to do. This is how Node.js and React PHP work. And with a parallel program that uses multiple threads, there will be several chefs in the kitchen. One of them can cook spaghetti while another one is cooking meat. Each of them can perform its own task completely independently. We are going to cover the async approach when we have one chef in the kitchen who is constantly busy with something. The advantage of this approach is that if we compare it with multi-threading, then in theory we can do more in the same period of time because our thread will be constantly busy doing something. This way we maximize the use of resources. Parallel execution with several threads is quite complicated in terms of writing code. You need to synchronize threads, reallocate memory, and so on and so on. While in theory, everything should be done in parallel and quickly, but in reality, chances is high that it will become just a mess. Let's consider a more realistic example. Imagine that we have some kind of a console command, a long living script that endlessly requests several data sources, some APIs, processes the results and stores them in the database. And we need the most relevant data in the database as soon as possible. It is critical for us. I don't know, for example, we analyze the prices from different stores to provide the best discounts based on this data. What is the traditional way of doing it? We sequentially make requests to APIs, sequentially process responses, and then sequentially store results in the database. I mean, we start with the first request, then wait until it is completed. We process the response, save the result to the database, and only then we start executing the second request. And then the third one. So what is the downside of this approach? Here our program is constantly waiting for something. We wait until the HTTP request is completed, and then we wait until the data is saved to the database. During these tasks, the execution flow is stopped and blocked. The program waits and thus it does nothing. As a result, uh, the total execution the total execution time of this code equals the sum of time spent on all three requests. The asynchronous approach uses the concept of non-blocking input-output. When read-write operations, they don't block the flow. What does this mean in our case? We don't waste time waiting for one request to be executed, to start another. We send the first request and while it is being executed, we can immediately send the second one and the third. While requests are executing, the flow can be busy with something else. Once the requests are completed, we can go back and process their results. With this approach, we wait only for the slowest request, instead of the sum of three requests like we did previously. So sounds interesting, right? But what does it mean, non-blocking input-output? How can I run tasks without waiting for them to be completed? And the fact is that input-output operations are rather slow. As a rule, they are executed many times slower than calculations. For example, when we discuss 
operations that our CPU does, we use nanoseconds. But when we deal with network communication, such operations are measured in milliseconds or even in seconds. So the difference is really huge. What do I mean by input-output? I mean read-write operations that actually any program has. API calls, interaction with the file system, database queries. Thus, programs written in a traditional blocking way, they spend a lot of time waiting for a response from disk or until a network request is completed. And if performance is critical for us, and we want to speed up the execution of our application, then we need to somehow start such operations in the ground, execute them asynchronously. How can this be implemented in PHP? Well, we can ask the operating system to process all operations related to input-output. For example, we need to read data from a file. If we don't want our PHP script to wait for the file system to respond, we don't directly communicate with it. Instead, we go to the operating system and tell it, please open the stream in the file system and read this data from it. As soon as the data is read, let me know. And that's it. Then our script can go away and do something else. Once the operating system does its task, we will receive an event from it, saying that the data is read so we can, can come back and process it. And to be able to listen to such events, to be able to come back and process them, we need a special architecture. We can't use traditional PHP flow. And the problem is solved by event-driven architecture, which is used, for example, in Node.js. Here, PHP and Node.js have something in common. Both are executed in one single thread. Only one task can be executed at a certain moment in time. And this doesn't really limit us. Everything that can be performed slowly, input-output operations, will in fact be executed not by our PHP script, but, but by the operating system. We'll only process events received from the system. Let's consider this approach in detail. All work, all interaction between different parts of the code in such an architecture is built on events. We have one running process, our PHP script, with a running event loop. The event loop under the hood is just an endless loop that listens to specific events and calls handlers for them. For example, we have some kind of input-output task, reading a file. We start it and tell the OS to read the data from this file. And that's it. Then the execution thread can do something else. We started this task and we don't wait until it is completed. Once the OS read some portion of data from the file, it sends us an event with the data that has been read. A record of this event is added to the event queue. The execution flow takes the first event from the queue and calls the corresponding handler for this event. For example, we calculate something based on this data from a file. The handler itself can also start, for example, two more I.O. tasks. Let's say we want to send this data via HTTP. And these new tasks can also generate their own events. Once the event handler is completed, the thread returns to the queue and takes new events that have occurred while the thread was busy. And this process that constantly monitors an event queue and calls corresponding handlers is called an event loop. The loop executes until it has something to do. Either tasks are performed in the background or something else hasn't been processed in the event queue. As soon as all tasks are completed and the event queue is empty, the loop stops. And having this kind of architecture, we can start several I.O. operations and we don't need to wait until they are done. Instead, we will know about their completion through events. And then we can go back and respond to these events. We don't waste time anymore. These I.O. tasks will run in the background for as long as they need. So what about PHP? Of course, in the language itself, the, we still don't have built-in support for writing asynchronous code. 
Yes, there are really low-level things, but we don't have such high-level abstractions like event loops, streams, and promises. But this doesn't mean that we can't use PHP to solve asynchronous tasks. With Composer, the problem with the lack of tools was solved by the community, and React PHP is the tool that makes it easy to write asynchronous code in PHP. This is how it looks. Let's quickly consider a very simple example in JavaScript. The set timeout function defers code execution, in our case printing the word world. And this code will be executed in specified number of milliseconds. Here we have zero milliseconds. So common sense tells us that a delay of zero seconds is basically the same as doing right here and right now. And we think that the word world will be printed first, and only then JavaScript will print the word hello. However, if we run this code, hello world will be printed. This happens because set timeout is an asynchronous function. It actually executes nothing. Under the hood, it takes this callback, puts it into the queue to execute later. And like our chef in the kitchen who puts the pot of water on the stove and goes further, the code is executed the same way. And the line that prints the word hello is executed next. Then the event loop looks through the timer queue, finds out that the delay of zero second has already passed and runs this code. That's it. Here we break the traditional sequential flow. The second call to console.log will be executed before the call inside set timeout. Thus, we receive the message hello world. And the exact same code written with React PHP looks like this. What's going on here? Let's examine the execution flow from top to bottom. At first, we create an event loop. Yes, in PHP, we don't have an event loop running in the background. Therefore, we need to explicitly and manually create it. Next, we add a timer, indicating that after zero seconds, this code should be executed. Then we print the word hello and manually start the event loop. At the time the event loop starts, the word hello is already printed. The event loop starts, it sees that the timer has already gone off. The corresponding event is fired, and in response to this event, this handler is called the code inside set timer, and the word world is printed. With this simple example, you can see the basic structure of any React PHP application. We create an event loop once at the beginning of the program. Then we write code that uses an event loop. This part describes the behavior of our application, how we are going to react to different events. And at the end of the program, we start the event loop also once. Let's remove the creation and the start of the loop and it turns out that the code written in React PHP looks almost the same like the code in JavaScript. The only difference here is that in PHP we need to explicitly create and run the loop. To get the result of an asynchronous process, React PHP uses the concept of promises. I think that most of you are already familiar with promises from the JavaScript world. Let's quickly refresh what promises are, and then we will look at how it works in React PHP. Consider the following example. Imagine that you come to a well-known fast food restaurant, and you decide to order something, for example, a burger. So you pay for it and expect to receive a burger in response. But the cashier gives you only a check with your order number on it. So consider this check as a promise to your future burger. So you take this check and start thinking about your burger. You don't have it yet, so you stand there and wait until your order number appears on the screen. And only then you can exchange your check, your promise, for a burger. So a promise is just a representation of some future value, a time-independent container that you wrap around 
this future value. For us as a client, in fact, it doesn't matter whether we have this value or not, we behave as we already have it. Let's consider another example related to programming. There is an HTTP request, some kind of task that may take some time to complete. And this task may succeed and return something in response, but it may also fail. Since the task is performed asynchronously, we don't, we don't have access to its result here and now. Instead, in response, we get a, a placeholder for the result of this task. And we can use this placeholder as if we already have this result. Then once the task is completed, the placeholder will be replaced with the actual value. So the promise depends on the state of the process that gave us this promise. And depending on it, a promise may be in three different states. Awaiting when the process is still running, resolved when the process is done, and rejected if the process failed. Everything the same we have in Node.js, right? From the client code, we can react to these changes in the state. Uh, Promise API allows us to write this declarative code. We declare that as soon as uh, the process, the get request is completed and we get the result, then we need to perform some action. Method then can also take two arguments. The first callable will be called when some deferred process succeeds and the callable receives the resolution value. And the second callable will be called when the process fails and it receives an exception that was the reason of the failure. Promises play a very important role. They allow us to control asynchronous execution. Uh, PHP runs in a single thread, which means that we don't have to deal with all this complexity associated with multi-threaded programming. But on the other hand, we need to somehow manage this asynchronous execution and coordinate actions in the application. Uh, what do I mean? For example, when we execute two parallel HTTP requests, this is usually easy and simple to do. But problems come when we need to streamline the responses of this request. For example, when one request requires data received from another request. And promises allow us to solve this problem with a chain of then calls. From method then, we return another promise. Here we don't care how long it takes to complete the first request. Less than a second or a minute. Promises hide these details from us. We just declare what and when needs to be done. As soon as the first request is completed, send the second one. Another basic abstraction in asynchronous code is a stream. When I say stream, the first thing that comes to my mind is video streaming. This is a very common example. We have some big amount of data for example, a movie file, and a client. The client wants to watch the movie in the browser via HTTP. But the client doesn't want to download the whole movie at once. Instead, we break this large file into pieces or chunks. Thus, we load several parts into the buffer. Then we send the buffer. When the buffer is full, we send it to the client. And repeat this way until the whole file will be sent. Streams play an important role in event-driven architecture. They allow us to process large amounts of data in chunks and under the hood, streams are just collections of data, something like arrays. The only difference is that uh, stream data may not be available at once, so streams don't have to fit in memory. Also, this makes streams an ideal tool for working with large amounts of data that constantly come from external source in chunks. Uh, for example, when you need to process a large log file, then there is no need, and even in a synchronous application it would be stupid, to load it entirely into memory. It would take time and resources. Instead, we read it through the stream, 
and receive a notification, an event, each time a new piece of data is ready. In this case, it will be a readable stream. If, for example, we upload the file and continuously write the data on disk, it will be a writable stream. There is also a bidirectional or duplex stream in which you can both write and read, for example, a socket connection. In fact, the duplex stream within itself represents a readable, writable stream simply combined into one object, each with its own buffer. Our streams API looks very similar to Node.js streams. Essentially, streams are event meters. When something interesting happens inside the stream, it can respond to this event. Let's continue with our example with an asynchronous HTTP request. In response, we get a promise that resolves with a readable stream. Why with a readable one? Well, because we can't write into HTTP response, right? So in order not to block the flow, in case, for example, when we requested some heavy resource, we get the response body as a stream in chunks. To read these chunks, we add a handler to data event, which occurs whenever there is a new portion of data available for reading. We call method on and specify the name of the event. Here we have data event and we add a handler for this event, a callable. In my case, I print receive chunk of data. And it turns out that while we are reading data from the stream, the application itself, it doesn't freeze and continues to listen to other events. We read a piece of data, then the event loop switches to something else. Once a new chunk of data becomes available for reading, the loop switches back to the stream again. Once the whole stream is fully read, it closes and it fires close event. We can also react to it. Writing to a writable stream looks the following way. We call method write and provide the string. It's very simple. So these were the basic low-level abstractions in which on which essentially all asynchronous code is written. We can consider them as building blocks of any React PHP application. But React PHP ecosystem is not limited to them. We already have high-level components for different types of tasks, components for working with storages, network, queues, there are asynchronous caches, logs, even various stream implementations, for example, JSON stream. Most likely, there is an already written component for your case. You only need to add your business logic. To take advantage of React PHP, actually, it is not necessary to take and rewrite your entire application to streams and promises. And in fact, I wouldn't recommend rewriting your application to make it completely, truly synchronous. This is a difficult, complex task. Instead, it will be much better to find bottlenecks where you have performance issues and try to fix them with React PHP. Let's get back to the application that we reviewed at the very beginning. We have a script that constantly pulls three data sources, process the results and save these results into the database. Performance is critical for us, and we want results to be in the database as soon as possible. And here it's obvious for us that the bottleneck is input-output operations, those slow synchronous HTTP requests. Take a look at this code. This is some kind of component inside the application, which provides the prices. Inside it uses Gazelle client and has a method that returns prices from a list of URLs. Under the hood, we sequentially make several HTTP requests to provided URLs. Here in the loop, each time the flow stops and waits until each HTTP request is executed. Well, we can try to rewrite only this small piece of code with the React PHP. How will it look like? Now in the constructor, we inject an asynchronous React PHP HTTP client and in event loop. Consider this HTTP client as a sort of guzzle, but for React PHP. And why do we need an event loop here? Wait a bit, it will be clear soon. 
Now, instead of responses, we have promises. Inside the for each loop, we start an asynchronous HTTP request each time. This time, the execution flow doesn't stop in this for each loop. We want to run all three requests at the same time and only then wait until they're done. In fact, in fact, in the loop here, we don't send the requests. We just describe how our asynchronous piece of code is going to work. Next comes React PHP function wait all. This is the reason why we injected an event loop. This is the most interesting part of code. Under the hood, the event loop starts running. Our requests are sent, and then the event loop will be running until these promises that we passed here are fulfilled. Or in other words, until these HTTP requests are done. As a, as a result of this function, we get an array of responses. And then we go back to the traditional synchronous flow. So let's recap. We collect data asynchronously and then continue to a synchronous flow. Amazing, right? Of course, you can say that I'm reinventing the wheel here and the same thing can be done asynchronously with Gazelle. Why do we need React PHP for this sort of stuff for making a synchronous HTTP request? And I will say, yes, you're absolutely right. With Gazelle or even with Multicurl, you can send HTTP requests asynchronously. But we can go even further. We can make the whole data processing flow asynchronous, starting from an HTTP request and ending with storing the data into the database. Let's try. Imagine that there is some kind of service that completely encapsulates the whole process. A request to API processing the results and saving it to the database. And does all these things asynchronously. Let's call it, I don't know, Price scraper. It will encapsulate an asynchronous HTTP client and some async database storage. Then we have a method that accepts a URL as an argument. So what happens next? First, we make an asynchronous HTTP request that returns a promise. From this moment, we work only with promises. Why? Everything here happens asynchronously and we need to somehow manage this execution. Once the request is executed, process the result. Once the result is processed, save it to the database and so on. So the HTTP request returns a promise that results with the response. Next, we process the response and build an object from it. And we return it from the promise. It means that this then call returns a new promise that resolves with an instance of class prices. Then we get this object and save it into the database. We also access the database asynchronously. Therefore, at the end of this, we also receive, receive a new promise. This promise resolves only when data is saved to the database or rejected if something somewhere has failed. The resulting promise can resolve with an ID of the record or with the record itself. It is not important here. Further, the higher level components of the application can decide for themselves how we can want to manage the promise. For example, we can limit the number of concurrent promises and start I don't know, only 50 requests at a time. So the bottlenecks have been fixed and there is no need to run the entire application asynchronously. Even the application architecture hasn't changed. Perhaps some high level components don't even know that this part inside works asynchronously. If everything is so cool, then let's make all project asynchronous. Everybody wants to have high performance, right? Why not? But uh, great power comes with great responsibility. And the biggest challenge we will face in PHP is blocking calls. Since the code is executed in one thread, then any long running operation blocks the entire event loop. The event loop must be constantly running, listening to new events and calling handlers for them. When one of the handlers runs too long, all other handlers wait, wait, and new events are not processed. And unfortunately, most of the function and libraries in PHP were written to work in traditional synchronous environments, so thus they block the flow. 
For example, you can't use sleep function if you need to delay the execution of any code. Instead, you should use timers. Any network communication with native functions block the flow. While the request is being executed, all the rest of the code waits. Actually, because of this, you can't use PDO and everything written on top of PDO. Doctrine, eloquent, because under the hood, PDO makes such network requests. Instead, you should use uh, stream-based clients that don't block the flow. You can't use all native functions for working with the file system. File exists, fopen, and so on. Instead, you should use special asynchronous adapters for the file system. Also, when using third-party libraries, you need to be very careful about what calls, what functions are used there, whether they can block the flow or not. In asynchronous codes, as an alternative to blocking calls, there are the following rules. When we need to get some value, we use promises. When we need to access some kind of API that constantly sends or receives data, then we use streams. This applies to asynchronous code in general. If we are writing a completely, truly asynchronous application, then there is a still a set of pitfalls waiting for us. People often complain that in PHP, we'll definitely have memory leaks. Firstly, in the latest versions of the language, the garbage collector was significantly improved. And secondly, in fact, this is not PHP problem at all. You can get the same memory problems in Node.js. Memory management in long living processes is your responsibility as a developer. You need to monitor, to optimize, to clean up unused resources. Closed connection with long living processes, your storage connection may be closed by timeout. It is necessary to somehow keep them open and alive. Maybe periodically check them and reconnect if required. Error handling needs special attention. Traditionally, when we have a separate thread for each client, with each request, the framework boots, the controller runs, and if something fails, it affects only one, this request. All other connections possibly stay alive, but in a synchronous application, for example, in case of a web server, if one connection caused an error, uncaught exception, then the entire application crashes and all clients are disconnected. Mm, very sad situation. We have also inconvenient debug. Due to the fact that everything in the program happens asynchronously, it is hard to predict its behavior. It is impossible to say exactly what and well will happen in the script. And of course, no more var dump and die. If we write that if this client equals this, then we make var dump and die. Yes, for one client, this code will be called, but again, it will stop the entire application and all the clients will be disconnected. Keep in mind that all clients or processes in the asynchronous application, they share a global state and they share the same memory. Let's talk why React PHP. Now in PHP community, we have several libraries or solutions that can you can use to write asynchronous code. I think that these are the most popular: React PHP, AMP, and Smoothie. Why I'm talking about React PHP today and not the others? Well, only two libraries from this list, AMP and React PHP, are written in pure PHP and can be installed with the composer. So if we compare React, PHP, and AMP, then React, PHP has a more solid documentation. Uh, the maintainers have spent a lot of time to write it, to make it completely full and clear. In addition, React, PHP has a strong, huge ecosystem with a large number of third-party components around it. The main difference between AMP and React PHP is that AMP uses the concept of coroutines, while React PHP uses promises. All interactions between components within AMP are based on coroutines and yield calls. Some people believe that coroutines are better than promises because they help 
uh, to get rid of promise hell. One can argue here, first of all, coroutines in PHP, as for me, I actually a hack that can be done with generators. And secondly, yes, the code seems like cleaner, like a traditional sync uh, synchronous code that we used to see. But with coroutines, the client code doesn't know anything about what it receives. There are no type hints. With promises, we at least know the interface that in a return from the components, we get a promise. It, is, it can either resolve with something or reject. But with coroutines, we get a generator in response and the generator can return anything. Also, it should be said that with React, with React PHP, you can also use coroutines, but with the help of third party library. Another very important thing about React PHP is that it is not something completely new, unreliable with a bunch of bugs. Not at all. The project itself is already quite old. Now I think it's, it is already seven or eight years old. React PHP is production ready and moreover, it provides long term support for its core component. So you can safely depend on them, receive fixes, updates and don't worry about backwards compatibility. I think this is really cool and a solid reason why you can start using React PHP in serious and maybe enterprise project. So to summarize, actually the idea of my talk wasn't to sell your React PHP. Despite the fact that I really like asynchronous PHP, I still understand that if you have the opportunity to use a more suitable language for solving your asynchronous tasks, I don't know, no GS or Go, then go ahead and use it. As for me, I suggest using Go because all this asynchronous magic is hidden from us inside the language there. In Node.js, you still have to keep in your head this event loop, these ticks, that this hap thing happens now, this thing is going to happen the next tick, and so on. With Go, you don't care about this stuff. Talking about PHP, there are no native tools for writing asynchronous code yet, and I think they are unlikely to appear soon. However, if you have already a PHP stack, a team of PHP developers, and an infrastructure for it, then you can consider asynchronous PHP. I mean, when adding one more language in your stack costs you too much. In this case, React PHP may be your choice. And my mission today was to show you that there are such tools in PHP, that they can be easily used, there is no black magic in inside. Just install it via Composer and you are ready to go. Moreover, the code itself even looks very familiar to what we use, used to see in Node.js. In cases when performance is critical for you, and at the same time you are waiting for some input output operations, whether it is a network request or a file system call, and this blocks you a lot, you can consider using React PHP. Perhaps an asynchronous approach can improve your application performance a lot. There is no need to complicate your stack with an additional programming language just because you need to solve some kind of asynchronous task. Perhaps PHP can solve your problem. There is no magic inside React PHP and even no additional extensions needed. It is written in pure PHP. But remember that you can't just plug React PHP into your project and it will immediately start working two times faster. No, it doesn't work like that. It is necessary to understand, to fully understand the whole concept of asynchronous code in order to gain all the benefits from it. That's why I spend a lot of time in this talk explaining how event loop, how promises and stream work. In a traditional synchronous application, there are a lot of blocking calls inside. If you try to rewrite such an application and make it completely asynchronous, uh, you will suffer a lot. It will be a very painful thing. Please don't do it. Instead, try to find bottlenecks in your application, often such bottlenecks caused by slow I.O. operations. You can try to fix these bottlenecks with React PHP. Typically, an asynchronous piece of code can be very easily plugged into traditional blocking code. Thus, it will be possible to increase application performance with a very little effort and without any architectural changes. 
that's it. Thank you for listening. And we're back again. Hi. That was an awesome talk by Sergey Chuk. Thank you very much, Sergey. With beautiful slides. That was really oh, that awesome. That flat design, I love it. So, Sergey, um, do it again, please. Uh, that was really good, really yeah, good quality. The reactions uh, in the chat were very positive. That was a great first talk. You should definitely do it again. Now, we do have someone on the call. Um, I know that face. Hi! Karsten! <laughs> Great to hear you and see you. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm fine, I'm fine, thanks. Um, I can, I, I have a, some have a beard, I have hair, I have grown have, a hair. You gr grew Actually, a ponytail, so. that's nice. <laughs> yeah, 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 all the, all the barber shops for club, not much we could do. I know, I, I've had my appointment uh, by now, so I look quite decent, I think. Beautiful, um, you look beautiful. <laughs> thank you, Maya. Uh, you do, Carsten, you uh, from the uh, things that Sergey talked about, about asynchronous PHP and React PHP, um, is that something that we are already doing in Flow or that we're considering doing? Or is that something that, you know, production ready enough that we could implement it? Where, where do we stand on, on that? Well, I mean, it's it's really a, a broad topic. Um, way, very um, put it out in a way, really explained the basics, um, and also showed some problems. Um, in Flow, we don't do asynchronous things, uh, at least not in that way. We do some th things asynchronously um, in a kind of homegrown way. PHP from uh, within Flow, uh, for example, during the proxy compilation step, this is something we do. Um, and there's a, a helper method uh, to um, allow developers to call um, Flow commands kind of in the background. Um, but that's not really asynchronously uh, happening. Um, we have also this, this uh, um, bundle of job queue packages that allow you to do something asynchronously in a way, uh, a separate process that is run uh, to do things like, uh, I don't know, uh, generating files that are that are heavy time or sending. So, um, uh, I mean, of course, we do a lot of asynchronous stuff in the NEOS UI. Um, obviously, that's, uh, you know, that quite nicely, um, but not so much on the PHP side. And is that something you think would be beneficial for the further development of Flow to include more opportunities or options for developers to use asynchronous uh, calls as uh, Sergey just showed to us? Well, options are always good, obviously. Um, when it comes to asynchronous processing, uh, in all the the years, the well, by decades, more than one, um, that I've been working with PHP, um, the need for asynchronous process pointed out uh, already um, because everything was just synchronous. And if you had problems with speed, you would, I don't know, uh, mirror everything to static files and be done with it. Um, but I mean, the, the need for something asynchronous has uh, evolved over time, but um, I experienced that in the past we could do that with things like job queues because it's really if if it's if it's really processing intensive, then it's in most of the cases also uh, time critical in the sense that the user clicks and they need. To more like, okay, now we can, or we can external process of booking something um, and then report back with a result or zipping up files, uh, creating archives or something. Um, so um, I don't really have the need for asynchronous programming yet. Um, but I mean, even things like using that so that, that you don't have the full startup cycle every time 
All right. So um, having that option would certainly, um, I mean, if, if there's a tool, then people are use it. Uh, you know, as you have to vent every, um, then you can come up with things that you can use it for that you want to try otherwise. All right. Carson, uh, thank you, thank you very much for uh, giving us uh, your perspective on uh, Sergey's talk about asynchronous and React PHP and how that could relate to Flow and Neos in the future. Um, uh, call to the community out there: if you see big needs for, or you know, improved needs for asynchronous support in Flow and PHP, uh, Flow and Neos, let us know. Um, so, you know, people like Carsten, who are really, really good PHP developers, uh, can take that into account for the next versions of Flow. Um, Carsten, thank you very much. Uh, we are a little behind the schedule, so we will switch to the next talk. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a great day, Carsten. Bye. Enjoy the day.